Hello and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. To become a better Spiro, come and join our spearfishing community at noobspiro.com. G'day and thanks for tuning in to the Noob Spiro podcast. Uh, pretty exciting day for us. We're, uh, we're in the season two, but... Um, today we're launching our first 101 series of episodes. So the 101 series, a uh, series that we're doing that uh, a lot of guys wanted to hear and that was just a series about the basics, straight from us, the basics, how to get started in spearfishing. So to kick that off, we're starting with uh, Shrek talking all about shore diving because that's where a lot of us start. So really excited to bring that to you. So in this episode, um, we're going to cover basic weather conditions and um, and sort of location conditions and what to look for, um, your gear requirements, what you're going to need to go shore diving, all the things like visibility and um, those shallow water and wave and swell and all the things that make shore diving difficult. How to find spots. Yeah, how to find spots, I guess. Planning. Like planning, why not? How to rig your gear. How to rig your gear. God, he's listening a while. Um, yeah, so we're going to go through all that for you, so really wrap up shore diving for you. And to follow that up, there's an article on the blog there by Shrek. Actually, there's three um, self-proclaimed good articles <laughs> by Shrek. He loves his homework about shore diving. No, they are really, really good articles. So, um, yeah, thanks for listening. And any feedback on the new format, let us know. That would be great. Enjoy the show. I wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water. And that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet. And I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. But when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots. It's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear. Don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in-store at their Brisbane and Sydney locations. Hi guys, going to start off today's show with a bit of a sombre note. Our, um, our thoughts and our prayers are with Matt Pennington and Lawrence Smith's families. Um, these, these guys died when their boat ploughed into a rocky outcrop near Morby Island, um, near Dampier in Western Australia. Um, not too long ago and yeah just just, just wanted to shout out uh, uh, pay tribute to those guys um matt pennington was a really well known spiro australian spiro who was a very friendly guy and uh so yeah really sad news righto shrek short diving 101 mate you wrote that uh, article it was pretty popular so um why don't we have a bit of a chat about shore diving um mate first thing what do you love about it like what's because i know we all start with shore diving and um, you, you were pretty keen in the early days on it, mate. It, it is a pretty good, pretty good place to start. What yeah. what makes it so good for you? I still like the simplicity of it. You know, like there's just no dramas. Um, Organisation's simple. Uh, once you kind of know a couple of spots and what conditions you need, and like weather wise, um, for that spot to work it's just very simple like you, you, you know what species you're going to encounter you know most of the time um and and you, you sort of know what to expect and it's just a very enjoyable relaxed sort of way of diving um that's once you've sort of established kind of you know you know how to how to how to spear in that particular location what conditions to go on you know and, and you you've got a good dive buddy things like that yeah, uh, I, I and you don't it. have to you don't have to prepare a boat the night before nah it's just throw your stuff in the car and away you go yep and uh yep 90 minute drive for me and i'm up in the location that i love i kind of know where a lot of the fish are going to be holed up and i just have a good time so yeah just the simplicity of it mate so if someone's going to start shore diving mate what are the first steps that you recommend getting into shore diving so I recommend finding an experienced buddy, particularly if you're just starting out, then there's a number of reasons for that. One is local knowledge. You can't beat it. Um, they they know. If, you, if, they're, if they've spent a couple of years diving that location, they're going to know what's the best weather, what's the best tide, uh, what to look out for, what species you might encounter, you know, how much weight, you, you, how, how, how well weighted you're going to want to be in the water and, um, and, and entry and exit points, are, they, they understand all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, 
And if, if, if you, even if you're hitting out with an experienced guy or you're just sort of hitting out with another person who might be the same level as you, Google Earth is a great tool to use to assess an area's potential. So like you might read about on a forum or something like, you know, area A is going to be fantastic and you can find these species or whatever, but it's very general sort of broad knowledge. One way you can sort of get in and assess the area for yourself is jump on, use Google Earth and have a look through the... Um, you know, the um, photos taken from space, and you can zoom right in and you can see where the reef structure is and sort of how that location and or where that location might be good. You can even do a preliminary sort of look at where you think you might be ent- entering and exit, exiting the water. So a bit, of, a bit of online research before you get started and maybe get a mentor or a buddy. You definitely need a buddy shore diving like with all the variable conditions. Yep. So... So the guys have got online, they've got a buddy, they've done the research, they've, yep. they've picked out their spot. Mate, uh, what do they look for next? Like how, if you are doing your research, what what do you look for in a location? Yeah, well, another way to do it is too is just ask your local retailer. Often they'll point you in the right direction as well. But, I mean, yeah, so you're going to want reef structure that's close to the to shore. I mean, no one's a... You're not going to be swimming three or four hundred uh, meters, or you know, a, a thousand feet on your on your first shore diving experiences. So you're going to want you're going to want low swell as well. You don't want to be um, contending with a lot of swell, as particularly when you're starting out, um, because that really makes things difficult when you're entering and exiting the water. And um, and a lot of the best um, dive locations for fish when you are actually out shore diving, it's in the shallower water in the swell. And so if you've got, you know, two metres of swell and it's breaking shallow and you're trying to spear around there hey. and, and and you're inexperienced, like it's just a recipe for disaster. So, and uh, in Sydney they talk about, we had a guest on a while ago, Jager, and he started off, um, you know, down Sydney and southwest rocks and places like that and they talk about big wash holes. And, um, like, if you're an inexperienced guy and you're diving in an area like that and you've got big swell you're contending with as well, that you know, that's that's no good. Um, All right, so what a – because you've moved on to conditions there. So what a you – know, we've got swell, that's playing, playing a big role. But what other sort of conditions like with visibility? What do you sort of look for um, and how do you sort of um, plan for good vis? So, again, like local knowledge, if you if you talk to your local retailer or you've got yourself a good buddy or, you know, you're just talking with guys online, start asking them about, you know, what wind and swell conditions do you need for the that spot to be optimal um, when you're heading out for your, your first sort of for, forays into your area. So it's great to be able to dive it in the best conditions possible. Um, so you've got, yeah, you've got wind and, and that – Direction and speed matter there. So, like I know in Queensland, on a northerly wind, if we have that for a couple of days, the water's just going to be just crap. You know, it just yeah. seems to stir everything up. Well, it, I think it. I think it slows down the longshore drift as well. So all your sediment coming north with your out of your river systems and stuff sort of gets trapped by that northerly wind that brings a current. Yeah, and that just holds up, and it's just murky and dirty. Yeah. It's often cold too, isn't it? It's cold and green and just there's no fish anyway, so. Perfect example, yeah, of, of, of local knowledge, you know, and, and um, you know, every area has those sorts of factors with wind. Um, swell's another one. Um, swell um, can be a ground swell, it can be a wind swell, it can come from different directions and um, can affect the way the sediment is stirred up differently. Um, you know, you might be able to dive a, you know, a three-metre southeasterly ground swell whereas you might not be able to dive a 1.5 meter wind swell coming out of um, the south you know the southwest or something you know just to give you an example so like again local knowledge ask questions ask the right questions big big tides are an issue too aren't yeah. they yeah yeah i was just going to go into tides and <laughs> so, so <laughs> good good preemptive no, you question weren't. there you were not um, <laughs> So, like, when the tide's coming in, they call that flood tide. When the tide's on its way out, it's called an ebb tide. Generally, with spearfishing, um, you're going to get your least tidal movement at the very bottom of the tide, around an hour each side of of the of the bottom and, and of the top of the tide. So, yeah, so, like, you're going to get your best visibility right at the very top of the high tide because you're going to get your least movement. So maybe you, you might jump in an hour before the very top of the tide, 
um, and and maybe stay around for an hour after the top of the tide. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, the water movement is minimal, so the sediment's going to have a chance to settle. Two, you, you're not going to have to contend with current um, either coming in or going out, and uh, you don't want to be dealing with current when you're diving from shore unless it's well planned and executed because it, it sort of complicates things. Um, so yeah, so there's a couple of reasons with um, yeah, and you've you've got all that the tide pushing that clean water in from outside as well, mm. which I always found fish help. seem to like feeding up too. Yeah, I, I found more activity. Yeah, like the top of the run out, I always found it was good for me. Um, what about rain? Rain rain seems to have a big effect, particularly here in southeast Queensland, doesn't it? Yeah, so any any anywhere you're around kind of like rivers or estuaries or um, bays and things like that, like your freshwater runoff um, can really complicate things. Sometimes we, we, you know, the Brisbane Bay will get dirty and it sort of, you know, it makes everything bad for, it might take, you know, <laughs> maybe 10 days to settle down after yeah. really severe rain. And so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, that's another thing you're going to learn with experience, but local people can help you with that. Um, and monitoring weather sites um, is another good way around monitoring your conditions. Mm. Um, I know a lot of guys that head out for sort of prolonged periods offshore here will use two different weather sites. We might use the uh, BOM uh, or Bureau of Meteorology um, app, and then you might also use Seabreeze and you know, even though they're using the same um, data, they come up with vastly different um, conclusions about... Oh, there's always a discrepancy. W- yeah. Willie Weather paints like a better picture by five knots, no doubt. Love it. I hate it because it lies to you. It's, you always got to add five knots to that, that yeah. system. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of what I do. That's a good rule of thumb. But like, so some, what some guys will do, they'll find the contrasting weather reports and then they'll sort of like look at both of them and make decisions. And like the longer you sp- spend time in an area, diving in an area, like the more knowledge you have to draw from. Mm. And uh, again, uh, I can't I can't sort of so um, we- emphasize it enough. Local knowledge is crucial, whether that's your retailer or your buddy or, or even guys online. But um, that, they're going to be the guys that are going to know. Making the switch from plastic freediving fins to a carbon or composite freediving blade makes a huge difference. Penetrator blades are lighter and more reactive and they've improved my diving and I'm sure they're going to improve yours. Pound for pound, pound for considerable pound, these (laughs) fins have made the difference for me. Being a 120 kilo unit and using the heavy glass blades just was getting a bit old. I've upgraded now to penetrator carbons and won't look back. I've been using penetrator fins for years now and I find the really reactive carbon fibre means I put less energy in for greater output, which means I spend more time on the bottom shooting fish. Check out the custom Noob Spiro Octopus Edition at noobspiro.com. All the same great features of penetrator blades with our new custom design. Or for the full range of penetrator fins, head over to penetratorfins.com. Guys, if you're after more podcast action, go and check out our mate Jason Selms over at australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. He talks all things hunting, shooting, and fishing. It's a great listen. He's getting plenty of downloads. He's big in Canada, South Africa, even Japan. It's fantastic. Jason talks to experts in the field on all things shooting, hunting, and fishing. It's a really, really good listen. So go and check him out, australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. The Australian Hunting Podcast is the only hunting, shooting and fishing podcast radio show in Australia. With over 40,000 downloads per month, you are sure to find some information that can help you. If you love hunting, shooting, fishing and a little bit of politics, the Australian Hunting Podcast has you covered. To listen, check us out on iTunes and visit australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. Right, we, we've got our we've got our local knowledge. Um, we've got our spot. We're, we're looking out for weather conditions, wind, tide, um, that kind of thing. All right, so it's dive day. Um, how do you go about um, planning? Like, obviously, entry and exit points are re- a very important starting point. 
Yep. Yeah, okay, so, like, you arrive at your dive location, you know, you found out where to go, you know, to the best of your sort of knowledge, you, you've you've got optimal conditions in front of you, you're looking at the beach and you, you've you got your equipment sort of sitting there. Um, the first thing you and your dive buddy want to do is plan your entry and exit points. And I don't mean, like, don't don't take it too lightly. Like, um, it's a really good way to get caught out. If you, if you have something go wrong when you're out there, like a medical emergency, like a... I'm not trying to be dramatic, but like you have a, a, a samba or or someone gets cut really bad from a dive knife or, you know, there's a, a myriad of factors if someone gets hit by a boat or something. You really want to make sure that you've got a well-established sort of plan for in, exiting the water. And, um, and, and, you know, that can be as simple as just standing there with your buddy and saying, okay, it looks like we've got a little bit of a longshore current there. Um, so we're going to get in there. And by the time we get out of the water, we're going to exit in that that calm patch there but it's good to have a backup sort of plan of action as well like a couple of different places to exit it's it's not much fun getting rolled across the rocks is it like barnacle covered rocks when you've got your you got your beautiful new wetsuit that you've just got you know and you're getting off the rocks and yep you start to get smashed by wave you're tumbling around and next minute all your gear scratched up your wetsuit's broken you're bleeding. It's like it's <laughs> you've ripped like, the ass out of your wetsuit. Yeah, exactly. You, it's not going to make you want to come back. Yeah. So, and that's a good scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you probably should be looking for like an exit point that is out of the swell, if possible. So yeah. if you're running like a southerly swell, you, you know, try and get out on the northerly side, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. What else you got for a Shrek? Besides, besides entry and exit points, what should the guys be looking for on dive day? So, like, if you're going out through a surf sort of entry, another thing to do is to rig rig your equipment for um, for that particular type of diving. So, like, um, a lot of guys, um, if you if you go onto newspirit.com, you'll see a really good picture there uh, from the armed snorkeler. He wrote an article for us called Three Mistakes I've Made Shore Diving," and um, one of the things that there's a photo in there, the way he's wrapped his float line around his gun to minimise any chance of entanglement and to just keep things really simple and streamlined on your way out through the surf line. Mm. You don't want to be you don't want to be battling with your gear and surf. You, so you want to have everything tied and secure and you, you want to know where everything is and make sure that it's not going to come off easily as you head out through the surf zone. Probably the same when you head it in when you've got fish on your float, which could further complicate things. So that's one thing you want to do. Um, yeah, don't don't wear your mask around your head um, when you when you're heading out or going or coming in because it'll come off. Yeah. Wear it around your neck like the bubble blowers do. It's a it's a good habit to to do. That way you're not going to lose the thing. Yeah. Um, another thing is fins. I see that many guys lose their fins. It's just part of it. The battle um, walking backwards in fins is another sort of common sense one. Um, it's not. Uh- I used to love it. I used to see uh, backpackers come into Bundaberg and they'd get sent down by the local scuba diving club. They put their fins on up in the sand dune uh. in, in their stinger suits <laughs> just looking sharp and then just like proceed to walk forward down in the rock pools. Uh, just awesome. So, yeah, it would definitely walk backwards. Would you put your fins on or do you, you dive in with those in, in hand? Or I, I think it's personal preference. Like um, I've, had, I've had a few good conversations about this. Some guys say, no, no, have your fins on. At least you know they're there. Despite the awkwardness, you're not going to lose them mm. and um, things like that. I, Depending on you know on conditions, like it might be a real rocky bottom. Um, I, I'm, and, and, and it's sort of like the depth comes and goes. I, I'll walk out in my booties to sort of where I assess the conditions to be good and then I'll put my fins on. Um, but so, some guys do, do do it differently. Um, I think it's personal preference though. Yeah, very good. No, I agree. Um, so with a float, uh, really re- don't use an inflatable float when you're diving through surf because um, it'll, it'll get punctured and it's game over. Same thing with those really trendy float lines. Uh, you don't want to be using like a PVC float line. That thing is going to tear up. It's yeah. game over. There goes your one hundred and fifty dollar float yeah, line. Agreed. Um, a, sh- a shorter float line too. Like often your water's shallower. Yep. And you you really don't want to be dealing with thirty meters of float line nah, in yeah, swell. That's... Like that is a nightmare. Love that. Yeah, fifteen meters. Like for a lot of shore diving applications is fine, and um, perhaps. Perhaps twenty, but I mean, if you can find a way to secure up 
the spear float line. Um, that's a good way to do it as well. That way it's just tidy and it's there if you need it, but it's secured and sort of stowed away if you don't. Obviously, too, with your spear gun, if you're diving from shore and you're in dirty water, um, you're not going to need a 1.4 meter gun. You're not going to nah. need a. You're not going to need a huge friggin' dual 20 mil band um, cannon. You, you, you're going to be happy with your one meter. You, you, maybe 1.2 sort of. That's probably the longer gun you're going to use. Yep. A lot of guys even use shorter than that, like a 900 mil gun. I, I don't know how that equates to um, Imperial. Do you? Nah, mate. Like, so I guess a three. Oh, no idea, inch, actually. Thirty <laughs> inch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, sorry to our American listeners, but um, same same thing with the wetsuit. I mean, it's a bit of common sense, but you're moving over rocks and barnacles, so you want a robust wetsuit. So some of the like um, the really um, the yeah, open cell outside wetsuits, they, yeah. they're going to get hammered. Yeah, you're going to you're going to rip that wetsuit. Um, it's game over. And, Mate, uh, I would almost say, like, honestly, when I started and I was rock hopping, yeah. I had, like, I did have a scuba suit and it was just tough as nails. Yeah. And I'm kind of, like, you know, you don't look like a Spiro and blah, 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 but those things, those old suits, they're tough as nails yeah. and you can pick them up cheap secondhand and you're going to trash that thing. Yeah. Like, honestly, like learning, the first time you get, first time you're sitting on your ass on the rocks and a wave comes, knocks you over and you go skating along, mm. if that's an open cell suit, you're going to rip the ass and clean out of it. So, yeah. like, I really recommend just, you know, it's, old stuff works well. Yeah. You know, these, yep. you know all, all as long years. as it's comfortable and, and yeah. like you've got freedom of movement, um, yeah. You, you just want a robust, simple suit, don't you? Yeah. And a surf suit might be okay for your first few sort of forays out there. Uh, you don't have to have all the best stuff straight away because you're probably going to wreck it anyway your yeah. first Oh, your and there's first been set. plenty of guns and gear lost yeah. short diving, haven't there? Definitely. Yeah, um, another thing that's pretty crucial when you are short diving is a stringer. So, like, this can be as simple as a bit of nylon that you use to kind of um, loop up all your dead fish and tie them onto your float. Um, a lot of the ones on the market, you'll see these really good speed spike ones where you just sort of stab them through the eyes or through the gill plate and then um, wrap it up and sort of tie it back onto the float. Um, they're great. Um, I, I, I recommend using, if you're going to use steel, Make sure that it's tied to the float with a bit of nylon because I've heard numerous stories of guys getting towed at a high rate of knots in the opposite direction to where they want to go because sharks have got hold of the fish on their float. Mm. And if they've got steel in their mouth, I'm sorry, that's not going to give. They're going to be taking you for a ride for as long as they want. So have some nylon on there. That way the shark can at least bite through it and you'll lose your fish, but you won't lose all your equipment. I, I, um, what I else? think fins too is one thing. I know, like, um, I mean, I started rock hopping with plastic, thermoplastic fins, and I couldn't kill them. Like, I, I was quite happy to sit on the rocks, sit on the fins so that the uh, the waves couldn't wash them away while I was cleaning out my mask or whatever. I can just sit on those fins, and I know they're going to get scratched, but, you know, they're not going to break. And it's probably true with, you know, like uh, sort of your more expensive fins, like your carbon fibres are a little bit more delicate. But they, you know, manufacturers do make really good tough fins made it like your fiberglass composites. Mm, like they're yep. so tough. Like those things, again, I used to just sit on mine. And shorter ones too. You don't yeah. need the, such long blades as well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. I mean, and some guys even just use really short sort of scuba fins in the swell. Yeah. Like the wave action doesn't affect them as much. Yeah. So they're not going to get pulled off as easily. Yeah. And like if you're in in and out little wash holes, you know, like I know a, a real favourite down like in Australia is – um is your mulloway or your jewfish, um, those things, are they're in the swell, they're in the swash, and they're in like like caves and rock holes and little sinkholes and stuff. Yep. And a big, long, cumbersome fin is not always what you want in yep. those situations. So, so like sh a, shorter, robust yeah. fin. Yeah, something with a bit of power too is always good for when you're really powering out through that swell, you know? Oh, uh, yep, yep. So maybe like uh, <laughs> some, some penetrator hard fiberglass <laughs> fins there, bro. Yeah, why not? Uh, good on you. <laughs> Disgraceful plug. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was species. Like for guys that are just just getting started, um, you, you, you're not going to shoot ten species on your first dive. You, you, chances are you're probably going to come across um, two or three species that are quite 
prevalent in that area. And your local retailer or your experienced person is going to sort of tell you what you're most likely to come across. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with the species in your area, try and um, get some really good, uh, get a really good idea of what those three sort of most common species are that you're likely to encounter. And remember the silhouettes and kind of like the, um, how would you say, like the distinguishing features. So there might be like a lateral line or the way their fins are shaped. I mean, you're not going to know after for a while sort of what you're looking for anyway. Mm. But um, chances are you're only going to ship possibly two or three different species. Learn those three species, what they look like. Make sure you know their sort of size limits and um because that's what you're going to be targeting on your on your first couple of dives out and you you sort of expand your species as you get more and more experienced yeah you got to keep it realistic too you're not going to go out there and shoot you know those trophy blue water fish you know like here in australia what are you going to get brim flathead are a good catch yeah like short Mowies, Mowies. <laughs> sergios uh maybe some parrots you know there are there are a few different species you, you're going to get lutterick are yeah. pretty pretty popular um, blackfish, they call them down down south. Um, they're all good. They're all good eating too. Like yeah. that's the beauty of it. They, they all eat well. Yeah. You know? And those first fish you you shoot, they they are memorable. They, I, I remember just just cleaning up on mowies and absolutely loving it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, dude. Um, but moving on. What about? Uh, I think it's about time we looked at a few hunting techniques yeah. for these inshore dirty water. Yep. So. Um, Again, when you're starting out, I mean, you're still getting used to all your equipment, how to move in the water, all these sorts of things. You're, you know, all of this sort of stuff's coming into it. But you, you really want to to get used to moving really slowly and um, doing everything quietly, uh, from clearing your snorkel to doing your duck dive to um, how you move when you're actually on the bottom. All of these things need to be done with a slow and steady cadence. If you just sort of Develop your own rhythm for the way you move through the water and it will stand you in good stead for all your sort of time spearfishing. And um, so that's probably the most crucial hunting technique is just slow everything down, minimise noise and movement and, um, and and you'll slowly sort of tweak your equipment so that you're fully comfortable with it. Um, I know a lot of stuff when you start out, um, <laughs> there's just... It, like you have a lot of metal parts and things that you can just bang against and you don't know how to secure your dive knife, things like this. They are all things that you sort of slowly work on over time. But, yeah, slow and steady cadence and um, just, just yeah. And of... eye contact's a big one too. All right. You know, I think like uh, when you're chasing like that flighty brim yep. and you're, you're staring it down like you're going to kill it, it's, <laughs> it's going to get that. Yeah, like it's yeah. going to understand that. And it, then they just they just go. Yeah, they'll leave you. So um, yeah, try to try to keep your head down. Try to look up through your your mask. Yep. Um, and and maybe not look at the fish as much as you can. Use your peripheries until yep. you take the shot. Love I think it. that that'll buy you a second or or two at least. Yep. Before the thing realizes that, uh, yeah. Another thing with shore diving is um, you're diving shallower, so a lot of the time. You, you you're going to probably have more weight on your belt than you're going to have if you are diving out wider in a boat. Um, however, it's something you've sort of got to learn as you go as well. Um, but rela- re- relaxing, relaxing is going to improve everything for you. Like you, not only are you going to get more bottom time and enjoy yourself more and be more focused and in the moment, but you're also going to scare a lot less fish. And it sort of alludes to what turbo was saying but um it it changes your body language when you're relaxed and um you know i I remember like when i haven't been out spearfishing for three or four months uh, and i see a fish that i want to shoot my my body language is just terrible you're like a dog with two dicks as jamie would say (laughs) (laughs) yeah perfect example and um and with with hunting too from shore I, i i talked about it earlier but a lot of your fish aren't going to be out in the deepest water that you can get to. They're going to be in the shallow stuff. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, riding up around the rocks in that swash seems to be where they go. Yeah. Where they are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another one, um, head straight for the bottom. Get to the bottom and, 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 you know, if you put structure in between you and whatever you're hunting, that's going to be good for you. So you're minimising your profile. Uh, it's another one. Yeah, there's more advanced techniques as you go along, but, I mean, there are a couple of good starting points for you. Yeah, and really it's about learning your species. Like, um, you'll sort of learn how um, 
the, the local stuff in your area behaves. Mm. So your brim's going to have a certain behaviour. You know, your, your mowie's going to have a certain behaviour. Your flathead has a very distinct behaviour. It sits in the sand and waits for you to shoot it. So um, they're like, they're, you know, everything's got its, its sort of behavioural characteristics that you pick up with time yep. in your area. And um, keep everything as simple as possible. Don't overcomplicate things. So simple gear, you don't need a dive watch. You don't need a camera when you're hitting out at the start. No. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just float line. Don't even worry about a reel or anything. Just keep it really simple and it won't do you wrong. And you can just slowly progress through all of the you know, fancier gear and stuff like that, like Darren Shields. You know, don't don't go out dressed like a Christmas tree, you know, like yeah, you're there advice. to shoot fish, not look like a model. Um, last last point for me, um, when you when you do start shore diving um, and you're going to be going to the regular s- spots all the time, it's a good idea to keep a log. Um, so, like, you're going to head out one day, like in March or something, and you might shoot a particular species and it's awesome. And that behavior is going to be the same again next March. And so you've you've captured a lot of data there that you can sort of learn from, and uh, you're going to know next year when to be in, in that spot again for those same conditions yeah, and good possibly point. the same opportunity. Yeah, good one. Cool. That's about it from me. Yeah, no, very good, mate. And um, so if the listeners, you know, if you want any more information on shore diving, they can check out your shore diving series. Yeah, so there's there's three good articles on there. There's shore diving part, parts one and two. Self, and self-proclaimed good articles. <laughs> oh, very good articles. I spent a lot of time writing them. <laughs> right, right, Shakespeare. <laughs> and then, uh, well, they might not be well written, but I think a lot of the information's there. And... Um, <laughs> Thanks for that. Oh, he's yeah. from New Zealand. He was taught by sheep, right, honestly. Yeah. Well, uh, the, <laughs> the, the armed snorkeler uh, has also written us a good article called Three Mistakes I Made Shore Diving and uh, Ryan Bellworthy. So check check that out, article out as well. It's a really good, good read. Thanks for listening today, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's uh, new series, the 101 series. Give us some feedback if you enjoyed it and uh, you want to see more of these things. Next episode is with Louis Van Senden from WA. We talk about hunting and finding the infamous Mulloway or Jewfish. It's a great episode with uh, lots of information in there, so listen in. Shrek, why don't you tell our listeners how they can save some money on spearfishing gear? Well, Adreno have partnered up with Noob Spiro to offer listeners $20 off all purchases over 200 bucks. And how do they take advantage of this deal, mate? Uh, listeners can use the code Noob Spiro at checkout online at spearfishing.com.au or they can use it in store at the Brisbane or Sydney stores. Excellent. And that code is Noob Spiro. That's right, Noob Spiro. Thanks for listening to today's show. Make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To learn more about becoming a better Spiro, visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter.